<clears throat> Welcome everyone. Good evening. We are going to be doing the Zerah Shimshon's commentary on Parshas Devarim, and we're going to do Os Aleph, the first uh, section in which the Zerah Shimshon actually starts uh, with an analysis of the first pasuk in Sefer Devarim and Parshas uh, Devarim. So let's read that pasuk, and then we'll uh, begin the commentary. So the pasuk said as, as follows. Ela had devarim asher diber Moshe el kol Yisrael be'ever hayardin. These are the words, or these are the things that Moshe spoke to Bnei Yisrael uh, on the other side of the Yardin, on the other side of the Jordan River. Ba midbar, ba arava, mo suf, bein paran uvein tofel, velovan vachatzeros de dizaha. In in the arava across from the Yamsuf, between Paran and Tofel, and Lavan, Chatzeros, and Dizahab. These are uh, place names. And Chazal teach us, and Rashi's going to talk about this in a moment, uh, that Moshe mentioned these place names not because this is where B'nai Yisrael was located. They actually were, were nowhere near some of these places. Uh, for example, Yamsuf, uh, which is where their journey began, and now they're, they were at the end of their journey about to enter Eretz Yisrael. Um, but rather Moshe mentioned these places because this is where certain sins, the Bnei Yisrael had committed certain serious transgressions and, uh, and sins. So let's, uh, we're going to hear what Rashi says about that, and then we'll hear what the Zer Shimshon says about the Rashi. We are on page Reish Pei in the Sefer, the Zer Shimshon, uh, and he says, starts as follows. Ela HaDivarim, these are the things, Pirish Rashi, Lefi Shehein Divrei Tochachos, because these are words of admonition, lefikach sosam hadevarim, therefore Moshe spoke about them very plainly, without details, v'his kiram beremez, and he only mentioned them through hints, through an allusion, through alluding to these uh, things. V'ibnei kavodam shel Yisrael, out of honor and out of respect for b'nei Yisrael. So according to Rashi, uh, Moshe mentioned the place names where they did certain sins rather than mentioning the actual sins uh, to show respect for B'nai Yisrael and to just allude to things that they had done wrong as opposed to explicitly mentioning those things. Kosha, the Zer Shimshon says, this is difficult. The Halakaman B'Mishnah Torah Gufe later on in Mishnah Torah, which is the name for Sefer Devarim, so later on in Sefer Devarim itself, Yechzirom Kulam Beferish. Moshe reviewed all of these places and the sins that happened there explicitly and in detail. Machlokis Korach, for example, the rebellion of Korach, Umaraglim and the spies, Ve'egel and the golden calf, Umahu Shekan Sasam. And what is the meaning of the fact that here in the beginning of the Parsha, Moshe mentioned them very simply without details, because later on he was going to mention them with details. And how is this showing covered to B'nai Yisrael? So the Zer Shimshon's question is a very strong one and a very straightforward one, and that is that if Moshe alluded to the sins that B'nai Yisrael did and then never mentioned them again, then, that, then we would understand the point exactly, we would understand Rashi's point exactly, that out of respect for B'nai Yisrael, Moshe only wanted to hint and allude to things that they had done wrong. But that's not what happens. Moshe Rabbeinu, in the first Pasuk, in the very beginning of Sefer Devarim, alludes to these, Averot, alludes to these sins that B'nai Yisrael did. But then later on in Sefer Devarim, Moshe explicitly in great detail goes through every single one of them. So therefore, how is that showing respect? How is that showing honor for B'nai Yisrael to actually mention these sins and go into detail about them, how does that show respect for B'nai Yisrael? The Yesh Lomar, the Zer Shimshon is going to give three answers to this question, and he doesn't specifically uh, necessarily articulate when he's giving each one of the answers, so we'll make sure to pay attention to that. The Yesh Lomar, and we can start the first answer based on the Medrash Rabbah. The Isa the Medrash Rabbah, because it states in the Medrash Rabbah, Al Pasuk Zeh, on our Pasuk in Sefer Devarim, Zeh Ru'uyim, uh, sorry, Ru'uyim Hayu Hatochachos Lomar Mipi Bilam, Vehabrochos Mipi Moshe. The Medrash makes a very interesting statement, and it says that criticisms and admonitions of B'nai Yisrael, whenever they were said 
uh, in the Torah should have been said by Bilam. When Bilam came to curse the Jewish people, that's what he was hired to do. You would expect him to have said all the critiques and, uh, and criticisms of B'nai Yisrael. V'habrochos mi Moshe. And the blessings, for example, the ones that Bilam said, really should have been said by Moshe. Ella, but, ilu hochichom Bilam. If Bilam had been the one to say the criticisms and the admonitions, how you Yisrael omrim, the Jewish people would have said, Sone mochichanu, an enemy of ours is rebuking us, meaning it wouldn't have been relevant to them. It would have been almost a mockery to them for Bilam to rebuke them. He's an enemy. He's, he's, a, he's a foe of the Jewish people. So of course he's going to say negative things about us. What, why is that relevant to us? Why, is that, why would that be meaningful to us is how B'nai Yisrael would feel. The Elam Bircham Moshe, and if Moshe Rabbeinu had been the one to say blessings uh, uh, about them, for example, the blessings that Bilam said, then it would have been the nations of the world who would say, oh, havam, uh, bircham. a one who loves them, a person who loves B'nai Yisrael is blessing them. And then that would not have been relevant. That would not have been important. Uh, the nations of the world would have said, of course, Moshe is going to say nice things about the Jewish people. He's completely biased. He has no credibility when it comes to this matter. He can't be objective. And so therefore, that would not have been taken serious. Omar HaKadosh Baruch Hu, so Hashem said, Yochichon Moshe She'ohavon. Moshe, who loves the Jewish people, will be the one to rebuke them. The Yevarcham Bilam Shesona. And Bilam, who hates the Jewish people, will be the one to give them a blessing. So each person will articulate things that you would never expect that person to say. In order that it will be clear that the admonitions and the blessings beyond Yisrael are justified in coming to the Jewish people. Ad Khan Lashono, until here is a quote from the Medrash. So basically what's happening is in order to give the greatest level of credibility to the things being said, Bil, Hashem arranged for Bilam to say blessings to the Jewish, about the Jewish people and for Moshe to give the tochachos, the admonitions, as he does and starts doing in the beginning of uh, our Parsha and, and continuing in other places in Sefer Devar. And with that yesod, with that fundamental concept, now the Zer Shimshon is going to provide an answer to his original question. The Lachain Omar Hakasuf, and therefore the Torah says, Ela Hadevarim Asher Diber Moshe al Kal Yisrael. These are the things that Moshe spoke to all of the Jewish people. Holil Shebau Mi Pi Moshe Davka. Since these words came specifically from Moshe, the Lomi Pi Bilam, and they did not come from someone who hated the Jewish people, such as Bilam, Nirin Li Yisrael Kimo Remez Ba'alma. They appeared like hints and allusions to the Jewish people, meaning even later when Moshe spelled out the sins that the Jewish people committed in detail, the people were more relaxed about it. The people were able to take, keep things in uh, perspective. The Ein Lahem Kol Kach Boshes Pani. And they were not humiliated as they would have been if it had been said by someone else. Umishum Hachi Hiskiron Beremez Mitchiva. And therefore, Moshe only mentioned and alluded to the sins in the beginning. Lomar lahem to say to them, Shekol Masha Yefaresh Acharkach, everything he would explain in detail later, who Litov lahem is for their own good, their own benefit, Ulichvodam, and he's saying it and, and, and out of respect for them. Kedei Shelo Yishma Umi and he is specifically, Moshe is saying, I'm the one who, who, who I want to handle. Hashem wants me to handle the tofachos, the admonitions, because in that way they won't come from an enemy like Bilam. The enom nechshavim el is ba'alma, and therefore all of the admonitions in Sefer Devarim only appear to the Jewish people like hints and allusions, which we see happening right at the start of the Parsha. So that's the end of the first answer. Just to summarize again, the Zer uh, Shimshon's question was, uh, what good did it do? What sense did it make for Moshe to allude to the sins if he was going to spell them out in detail later on? And the answer is, actually, Moshe was setting the tone for the Jewish people and saying to them, 
Uh, I want you to know that I love you and support you, and any criticism I give is a constructive criticism to help you learn from your errors of the past or the mistakes made by your parents and your grandparents. And so therefore, I'm only going to allude to the sins in the beginning. And so even when I mention them in detail later on, you should take them in the same way and in the same spirit. You should never view them as, as anything being said with malice or anything that's too harsh. You should view them as ways to help you improve and to grow, uh, even when they're said in detail later on in the partial. That's the first answer. Now the second answer is come. Bottom of the first column. The Ode Yesh Lomar. The is of a Perik Vav de Sanhedrin. And we can also answer this question through a Gemara brought in the sixth Perik of Masefa Sanhedrin. And the Gemara says, Kitanai, there is a machlok tanaim, there's an argument amongst the sages of the Mishnah, based on the following Pasuk, Hanistorus Lashem Elokeinu, Vahaniglos Lonu Ulevanenu Ad Olam. That Pasuk means the hidden things belong to Hashem, our God, and the revealed things belong to us and to our children forever. So on that Pasuk, which distinguishes between hidden uh, sins and open transgressions, there is a machloket in uh, between two, uh, two Tanaim, two sages of the Mishnah. The first opinion is, Melamed shelo anash al hanistaros ad sha'avru Yisrael esayardi. This Pasuk teaches us that the B'nai Yisrael, the Jewish people as a whole, were never punished on hidden sins uh, until they crossed the Yardin. Divrei Rebbe Yehuda, these are the words of Rebbe Yehuda. That would mean that the entire time B'nai Yisrael was in the Midbar, uh, the, the group, the whole Jewish people, the community, could not be punished for the sins committed in, by individuals in secret. However, once they cross the Yardane, then they could be punished for sins committed by individuals, even if those sins were committed in private. That's Rabbi Yehuda's opinion, the first opinion. Amr lo Rabbi Nechemya, Rabbi Nechemya said to Rabbi Yehuda, Vichi anash al anistaros me'ola? Was it ever the case at any point that the Jewish people as a whole would be punished on the sins committed by individuals in secret, in private? But it was already said, and there the, the Pasuk is quoted that we mentioned before, Ad Olam, until forever, forever the Jewish people, according to Rabbi Nechemia, could only be punished on this, the open public sins of individuals. They could never be punished at any point on the hidden sins of individuals. Ella, so what is the meaning of the Pasuk? Keshem shelo anash al hanistaros, just like the Jewish people were not punished uh, before they crossed the Yardin on the hidden sins of individuals, kachlo anashal haniglos adsha avruesa Yardin, so too they were not punished on the public open transgressions of individuals until they crossed the Yardin. So let's pause and take a moment to understand this machlok at this argument from the Gemara and Sanhedrin very well, because the Zerah is going to build his, his second approach, his second answer to the question on this argument. What's happening is the two Tanayim, Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Nechemya, agree that there was a fundamental change uh, in the status of the Jewish people when they crossed the Yardin, when they crossed over the Jordan River and they entered Eretz Yisrael, something very significant happened in terms of communal responsibility. Both Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Nechemya agree that the community took a higher level an elevated level, a much more serious level of responsibility for the actions of individuals after they crossed the Yardin. The disagreement is that according to Rabbi Yehuda, the first, school, the first opinion, the first school of thought, even before they crossed the Yardin, the community could be held responsible for the open public acts of individuals. Once they crossed the Yardin, then the community, the whole Jewish people could be held responsible for the secret private acts and sins of individuals. According to Rabbi Nechemia, however, before they crossed the Yardin, there was no level of responsibility for the public communal responsibility for the individual actions, the individual, the averas of individuals. There was no level of responsibility of that before they crossed. Once they crossed into Eretz Israel, then the community, the Jewish people as a whole, became 
uh, responsible for the public open acts and sins of individuals, but not the private acts of individuals. That's the Mahloket, and we'll see in a moment how the Zerah Shimshon uses this to answer his question. Second, parag- second column, second paragraph. Um mishum hachi omar akosav, and because of this, the Torah says, Ela hadevorim asher diber Moshe al kol Yisroel be'ever hayardi. These are the things that Moshe said to the Jewish people, Be'ever Hayardin, while they were on the other side of the Yardin. Those words take on tremendous significance now. They had not yet crossed the Yardin. They had not yet crossed into Eretz Yisrael. And as we just saw from the Gemara Sanhedrin, that's a very important point to make. She'elu ha'tolchocho she'osa Moshe kan Yisrael b'mishnah Torah, heim kimo remez ba'alma. These admonitions that Moshe gave the Jewish people throughout the book of Devarim, not just in the beginning, not just the psukim that we looked at at the beginning of the Parsha, but throughout the book of Devarim, all of the admonitions and criticisms and rebukes that Moshe gave the Jewish people need to be viewed as hints and allusions, not severe, harsh criticisms. Why? Lefisha adayin heim be'ever hayardin because they were still on the other side of the Yardin. Shelo kiblu alehem ha'arvus echad al And they had not yet accepted communal responsibility one for another. The afilu al haniglos, and this applied even to sins done in the open, publicly committed sins, kedas Rabbi Nechemia, according to the view of Rabbi Nechemia, the second school of thought that was brought down in the Gemara. V'chol echad mehem eno chayiv, Ella al Chelko Dafka, and therefore each Jewish person was only responsible for his involvement. Shahaya Lob Oso Hachet, that he had in any specific Avera. Since there was no communal responsibility according to Rabbi Nechemya, and since there was only limited communal responsibility according to Rabbi Yehuda, both agree that people were only responsible essentially for their own actions and could only uh, be punished for the actions that they themselves took. They couldn't be punished for actions that other people took. This is before they crossed the Yardin. And many of them only had a very minor share in the sins that were committed by the Jewish people, by, by, in, by members of the Jewish nation. Shehukimo remez ba'alma. And this, therefore, the criticisms that Moshe gave, therefore, should all be viewed as hints and illusions. Ashkechon be'egel, as we find mentioned in the Gemara in Meseches Yuma about the egel hazahab, the golden calf. So the Gemara over there says that there were different levels of punishment for the different levels of involvement in the sin of the golden calf. And, and he quotes the Gemara. Zibach v'katar, if a person brought a sacrifice to the golden calf or burned incense to the golden calf, b'sayef, then that person would be killed by the sword, the hule, etc. Somach belibo, if a person did not worship the golden calf at all, but he only was happy in his heart, he privately rejoiced that the golden calf was built, behadrakon, then that person would suffer from a, a painful stomach ailment. So the Zer Shimshon is quoting that Gemara to tell us that in each sin that was committed in the Midbar, different people participated on different levels, and each person only had the, con- the consequences and a punishment based on his or her level of participation in the sin. But they did not bear consequences because of other people's, due to other people's participation. Each person was only responsible for his or her share in the Aveil. So let's pause there because that's the end of the second answer, and let's explain the second answer. According to this approach, the Zerah Shimshon is saying the reason Moshe mentioned the sins in the beginning in a very uh, hinting way and not coming right out and saying them, even though he was planning to mention them in detail later on, is because he wanted to set a tone and let B'nai Yisrael know that he understood a very important point. And that point was that they bore no communal responsibility for the actions of other people, and they only were responsible for their own actions, and he knew that many people were not, did not participate in specific, <coughs> in specific sins. 
which is very important because when we read Sukkim, we often think to ourselves, everyone participated in all the sins. Everyone participated in Egel Hazahab. Everybody participated in complaining and murmuring. Everybody participated in this sin or that sin. Sometimes it seems from the Sukkim that that may be what happened. So the Zerah Shimshon is emphasizing to us that Moshe was emphasizing himself to the Jewish people that he knew that wasn't the case. He knew that many people didn't participate all in certain Averot, and he knew that some people participated in a very minor way and on a lower level, and, and, and then, of course, other people can participate in specific sins in a more direct way and, a more, and had a more major role. But Moshe was saying, I am only hinting to these sins because I know that not everyone participated and, and you did not bear the responsibility for your neighbor or your friend or your relative or your family member. You only bear responsibility at that point uh, for a sin that you yourself participated in and only to the degree uh, that you were actually directly involved. So that's the second answer. The Absharnami Lomar, and we could also say as an extension to this, but it's really kind of a third approach, in the beginning of the Parsha, Moshe gives a very general mentioning of the places where sins happen because he specifically has in mind the people who only had a minor role in those sins. And later on, he mentions the sins in detail and specifics corresponding to the people who actually were actively involved in a very direct way and had major roles, a major role uh, in the sense. So we now, at this point, when we stop here uh, in the middle of the second column, about three quarters down in the second column, uh, we have the Zer Shimshon's three answers. Let's quickly um, review the question and the three answers because now, as we go further, the Zer Shimshon is going to use the approaches that he's developed to explain a problematic Pasuk in Parshas Korach, which is not directly related to the things that we're talking about, but uh, except for the fact that what he's ex explained here can help understand uh, that section in Parshas Korach. So the question in a nutshell was, how come Rashi said that Moshe only hinted to the Jewish people's sins out of respect for them, when actually Moshe did hint in the beginning of the Parsha, but then afterwards mentioned all the sins in great detail? How is that showing respect for the Jewish people? That was the question. The first answer was that Moshe Rabbeinu uh, wanted to uh, set a tone for the Jewish people right from the start by saying, I'm only hinting to your Averas because I respect you and I loved you and I care about your feelings. I'm not, I don't want to humiliate you. I don't want to embarrass you. I don't want you to feel like I'm overly harsh in my criticism. I'm doing this for your own benefit. So he sent that message very clearly to them by not even mentioning the sins, by only mentioning the places where the sins happened. Therefore, later on when he did, Moshe did mention the sins specifically in detail, he was able to say, remember what I showed you in the beginning? I'm only doing this for your own benefit so we can learn together from what happened so you can improve. It's not, it's not a negative experience. It should be a positive learning experience. That is the first answer. The second answer, uh, based on the Gemara, the Machlokas, and the Gemara in Sanhedrin, is again that Moshe wanted to set a tone, but here the tone is different. The tone is, Moshe said to the Jewish people, we have, you have not yet crossed the Yardin. You have not yet crossed into Eretz Yisrael. And therefore, you only bear individual responsibility. You, you don't yet have complete arvut, complete communal responsibility, which would make each person fully responsible for the actions of other people. Since you don't have that, and you're only responsible for your own actions, therefore, I'm going to mention the, sin, the sins that happen in a very... A light way just by mentioning the places where they happen so that you know that I'm aware of the situation and I know that many of you didn't participate in these sins or if you did you only had a minor role and I also am aware that therefore you can't bear any consequences or responsibility for what other people did. That level of responsibility, communal responsibility, comes only will come after B'nai Yisrael crosses the Yardin and of course that did not happen during Moshe's lifetime and that didn't happen in the Torah at all. That happened after the completion of the Torah. Moshe dies, the Torah is completed, and only after that did B'nai Yisrael go into Eretz Yisrael, where they take on the elevated higher level of responsibility. And then the third answer, 
uh, was that Moshe mentioned things in the beginning in a hint because he had in mind to give Musa to the people who only had a minor role in the sins. Later on, he went into great detail because he knew that there were some Jews, unfortunately, who had a very major role in participating. And so therefore, he wanted them to learn as well. And they had to learn specifically about all the things they were involved in as opposed to the first group, which either were people who either weren't involved or were involved only in a minor way. Those are, that's the question and the three answers. Now let's continue to our problematic, challenging Pusuk in Parshas Korach. And according to this, we can explain the Pusuk in Parshas Korach, which says, Will one man sin? And you will become angry uh, against the whole congregation. That Pusuk is um, uh, coming from a conversation between Hashem, an exchange between Hashem and Moshe. Right after the rebellion of Korach started, Hashem said to Moshe, remove yourself from the people, from the Jewish people. I will wipe them out, and I will start a new nation with you. I will begin a new nation just starting with you. So Hashem was so angry over the rebellion of Korach that he actually suggested to Moshe that he, was willing, he would be willing to wipe out the Jewish people in their entirety and leaving only Moshe to start a new nation. So Moshe responded with the Pusuk here that was just quoted, Ha'isha chad yechata, will one person sin and you will become angry against the whole congregation, meaning, meaning Moshe was saying to Hashem, why would you uh, think of wiping out B'nai Yisrael? They're, they're not participating, the majority of people, the vast majority are not participating in this uh, Aveva. So the Zer Shimshon says, Dekosha, this is actually a difficult Pusuk to really understand. Shahari matzinu shaharbe mehem chotu. We actually find that many people participated in the rebellion of Korah, Ubeprat, and the Torah specifies Masayim Bachamishim Ish, that there were 250 people who followed and joined Korah's rebellion. So that's not a, an individual, that's a large group. Umahu Haish Echad. And so, what is this mentioning of one man? Shenira Shalohayachote El Ish Echad, which makes it appear as if only one person was doing a rebellion, was rebelling. But that's not true. It wasn't just Korach. It was Korach followed by 250 uh, other people, a large, uh, a large group of, of rebels. So why did, why did Moshe say one person? Va'od, and more so, im ha'emes shahaya ish echad ha'chote. And if in truth it really had only been one person, if only Korach was going to be held responsible for the rebellion, ma ha'yes ha'sparas ha'kadosh baruch hu yitchila. What was the thinking, what was the rationale, the logic of Hashem from the beginning, to say he was going to wipe out everybody? Of course, Hashem would never say one person does a sin and everyone's going to get wiped out. So how could that even have been a possibility if it was only one person's sin? And why did it say, which means a man will sin in the future? The tiktsof, and you, Hashem, will get angry, will get angry in the future. Lashon ati, using a tense, a future tense. The event, the rebellion had already started. So Moshe, you would think grammatically, should have said, will one person commit a sin? One person has committed a sin, and now, Hashem, you're angry with the whole people? It should be be'avar. Be it should be in the tense of the past tense, or possibly past tense and present tense. But there's no reason seemingly to talk about future tense, to use future tense with events that are, are, have already happened or are already taking place. So the Zer Shimshon has several questions on the Pasuk, which he will now use the approach that he developed uh, based on the Gemara and Sanhedrin, which was the, the second answer that he gave to explain the Pasuk in the difficult Pasuk in Parshish Korah. Bottom of the second column. The Yesh Lomar, and we can answer this, these questions the Asiya Bapluta the Rebbe Yehuda the Rebbe Nechemia, that all of this exchange between Hashem and Moshe regarding the rebellion of Korach is actually uh, connected to the argument that we saw between Rebbe Yehuda and Rebbe Nechemia. Im Onash al Hanistaros, O al Haniglos, Achar Sheobruas Hayardin, which was essentially about whether or not 
the Jewish people as a whole could be held responsible, would be held responsible for even the hidden sins of individuals, which was Rabbi Yehuda's opinion, or only the public open sins of individuals, which was Rabbi Nehemiah's opinion, after the Jewish people crossed the Yarden. We're going to see how that connects to the story in Korah. In the beginning, Hashem was following uh, a strict approach, a stringent approach, according to the view presented by Rabbi Yehuda, that they would be obligated while they were in the Midbar and while they were in the Aravot, meaning, meaning before they crossed into Eretz Yisrael, they would be responsible al Haniglo on the public sins. So according to that opinion, Hashem would say, because Korach's rebellion was done openly, all of the Jewish people, even the ones who did not participate in Korach's rebellion, could in fact be held responsible for it. And later on, when they crossed into Israel, then they would even be held responsible for hidden sin. But the, but the rebellion of Korach was not a hidden sin. The rebellion of Korach was an example of an open public rebellion. And therefore, according to Rabbi Yehuda's opinion, which Hashem originally embraced, all of the Jewish people could be punished for the rebellion of Korah. And Moshe replied to Hashem, Just the opposite, meaning we shouldn't follow the view of Rabbi Yehuda, rather we should follow the opinion of Rabbi Nehemia. After the Jewish people cross over the Jordan River, Lo yikansu arevim ella al haniglos. They will not have communal responsibility except on public sins. Umamela nishma she al hanistoros me olam lo nischayu. And from that we learn that on private sins they would never be held responsible, whether before they cross the yardim or after they cross the yardim. But the main point is that if they were not responsible for public sins before they crossed the Yardin, according to Rabbi Nechemia, then Hashem could not punish the Jewish people. Hashem would not and could not punish the Jewish people for the rebellion of Korah. He could only punish the rebels themselves, not the rest of the Jewish people. V'chein Omar Moshe l'ifnei HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and this is what Moshe said to Hashem. Mikanu l'haba from now into the future, meaning once the Jewish people cross the Yardin into Eretz Yisrael, if a single person sins, that's why the Pasuk talked about a single man. If a single person sins, meaning it has nothing to do, it's not talking about Korach, it's talking about in the future when Bnei Yisrael crossed it over the Yardin, then if a single man sins, meaning a single person, an individual, Ubenistar, and he does an Avera, which is in private, Ha'im al kol ha'eda tiktov, will you, Hashem, become angry and punish the whole Jewish people, mitam arvus, because of the reason of communal responsibility? Halo ze'yiyeh din koshe. This would be such a harsh approach to judgment. Neged midoscha, and it would go against your character. Sha'ata rachum v'chanun, because you, Hashem, are merciful and compassionate. Dechsid, as it's written in a pasuk in the Navi Chabakuk, berogez rachim tiskor. Hashem, even when you're angry, you remember your mercy. You're compassionate, even when you're angry. El hadin sheyesh lasos. But the Moshe says the 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 best approach to take Hashem that is fitting with your merciful, compassionate nature. Hainu shelo yiskaivu rak al arvos haniglos that even after they cross over the Yardin and have communal responsibility, it should only be for open and public Avero. And according to this approach, meaning according to this approach of Rebbe Nechemya, now, they're not at all, they have no communal responsibility before they cross the Yardin. You should not get angry, Hashem, on anyone who didn't actually participate in the Avera. Omar lo, so Hashem said back to Moshe, in Cain, if so, meaning if so, yes, I accept your argument, and I'll follow the view, the lenient, the more lenient, compassionate view 
that you're advocating for Moshe, Ha'elu me'al mishkan korach. In that case, uh, as the Pasuk says, Hashem said to Moshe, tell everyone to separate away from Korach and his uh, rebels, move away from them completely, Vahule, et cetera. We know what happened. The punishment came, the earth opened up, and only Korach and the rebels were swallowed and punished, but the rest of the Jewish people were spared any punishment at all, which exactly is exactly what Moshe was arguing for, and that was the ultimate triumph, uh, according to the Zer Shimshon, of the opinion and the viewpoint of Rabbi Nechemya, uh, as opposed to the view of Rebbe Yehuda, given in the Gemara Sanhedrin that we saw earlier. The Zara Shimshon continues on with an, a very deep analysis of a couple of psukim in Sefer Tehillim, uh, but that would take us way beyond our time frame and also really beyond the, spo- the, the scope of our um, discussion. So uh, to sum up, the Zara Shimshon has posed a very fundamental question uh, about the, the uh, Moshe's intention when he rebukes the Jewish people uh, in the beginning of Sefer Devarim and an understanding he, uh, of Rashi's comments on the first uh, Pusik in Sefer Devarim and he's get asked, poses questions, he's given us three approaches to answer those questions and then he's taken one of those approaches and used it, utilized it to explain a, a difficult Pusik uh, in Parshas Korach, which so now we have insights into Sefer Devarim, the beginning, and also going back a ways, we have some insights, useful insights into uh, Parshas Korach. Yashukoch to everyone.